do a record on. Just, I know what I'm doing. We're going to match up the video to the audio with a clap. Okay. And then we'll get rolling. Sound good? <coughs> Welcome to the Auto Transport Values Driven Service Delivered Podcast. My name is Brenton and I'm the Liquid Tank Manager at Autumn. I'm joined today by Chris Senti, Autumn Safety Director and the owner of Senti Transportation. Hey man, how's it going? It's going good. How are you, Brenton? I'm having a good day besides the snow. Yeah. It just doesn't ever want to stop. They need to quit shaking their snow globe. <laughs> That's what it looked like outside earlier today from yeah. here. Well, this is exciting. You're the first guest on our very first Autumn Podcast. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, I'm proud to do that. Be the first one. That's sweet. The focus of the podcast today is owner-operator safety and specifically looking at the topic of vehicle maintenance. Now, this is something that seems to be a rising concern all across the commercial transportation industry. We're seeing a trend in DOT officers being increasingly stringent and sophisticated in their roadside inspections with a big focus on vehicle maintenance. With that in mind, I wanted you to join me today to talk about what owner operators need to know and what they can do to make sure their truck and trailers not only pass inspections, but more importantly, to ensure that they're in safe working condition while on the road. So I got, a, I got some questions to go through with you, but yep. before we do, I, before we dive into that, why don't you give us some background on your experience as a truck driver and as a safety professional? So I got into trucking in 1998. I was actually working out at the Minneapolis airport, uh, running a fuel farm there, and all the fuel was bought in by semis. Hmm. And one of the old timers, you know, he's like, hey, do you want to drive the truck around the airport? I'm like, yeah, I do. <laughs> uh, so I kind of got the trucking bug then, and I went on to get my CDL and hauled fuel to airports in the upper Midwest. And then there I went to a company hauling nursery stock for 17 years. And while I was there, I got into the safety aspect of it in DOT compliance in 2010 and uh, took over as their safety director in 2012. Okay. And that's where I got into the safety part of things. And I enjoy doing safety because I get to help people. Uh, my passion is making sure that everyone is successful and then they get home the same way that they came to work. Uh, because we all want to go back to our families the way we left in that morning. Yeah. Uh, from there, I went uh, to a public over-the-road 48-state long-haul carrier that did specialized hauling. Uh, so I got over-the-road experience with them. And then from there, I went to an LTL company out of Bismarck, North Dakota, uh, where I got exposed to the LTL world. And for those that have driven LTL or over-the-road, it's completely different careers. Sure. Uh, you're going from dealing with drivers you never see to drivers you see every day. Uh, so you're, you're getting a different exposure. Yeah. Uh, and then from there, I went on to start my own company in 2020, uh, doing safety and compliance consulting. And so. how did you find Autumn at the end of that journey? <laughs> so, uh, oddly enough, uh, when I worked with the specialized carrier, uh, I worked with Jennifer Nat, who's our safety admin here at Autumn. And she knew that, um, uh, I was looking for a job at the time after I had left uh, the previous carrier and Josh Wallen, the GM, called me and said, hey, we hear you might be looking. I said, well, I just started my own company. Yeah. And he goes, well, how about we have a partnership? So okay. we, uh, when I met with uh, Josh and Julie, they said, uh, how, how about we have like a dating period? Well, you know, if your company goes okay, you keep us as a customer, but if it doesn't, then you can come work for Autumn full time. And, uh, much to Julie's dislike, the company took off. So, okay. uh, but I will say that I have absolutely loved it, being part of the Autumn family for the last two years. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've absolutely loved having you here, Chris. Get a lot of great feedback from not only dispatch and people on the office support side of the building, but also from the drivers. And I think we see a, a big response on social media on our Facebook page when we say anything about our safety director. <laughs> A lot of drivers are jumping in there to compliment you and I know they enjoy working with you quite a bit. We we work with an awesome set of drivers, very professional, they they take their job seriously and they're worried about the autumn uh, reputation. Yeah, well safety and reputation kind of go hand in hand and 
trucking quite a bit. Yeah, and we'll be getting into that with one of the later questions about what's your reputation. For sure. Well, why don't we start jumping in to talk a little bit about uh, vehicle maintenance, particularly safety in general. You've been talking a lot in the office here at our stand-up meetings and with dispatch and kind of beating the vehicle maintenance drum. Then the last probably month, I would say, we've seen kind of this focus from you and wanting dispatch to make sure it's part of our routine with our drivers, things we're talking about. Why has vehicle maintenance become such an important topic for you? Well, for me, it's with our CSA scores, we've seen an increase in those scores. Uh, like I said, when working with our awesome drivers, they've been able to lower every basic that they've worked on, except the vehicle maintenance. That one's been kind of a problem lately, and its score has just been gradually going up. So we're trying to focus with the drivers to prevent the violations at roadside because if we can prevent the violations at roadside and get some clean inspections, then our score is gonna drop. Right. And I always try to set goals for our drivers because you have to have something working toward. And one of the things we wanna do is get that crystal semi from the MTA to have, you know, that we can say we're the best fleet in the state of Minnesota. For sure. And that's our one little sticking point right now is the vehicle maintenance. Gotcha. Well, I mean, no one's ever exactly where they want to be in a lot of areas of life. And so it's good yeah. to set those goals and those targets. And uh, uh, that Lowell, who started our company, he said um, he, he used to talk about not expecting what you don't inspect. Yeah. And that idea that if we're not talking about something and inspecting it and keeping it before people's eyes, it's easy to forget sometimes. Yeah. And so I'm all on board with making sure that we're talking about vehicle maintenance. What about the bigger picture though? What makes it important? Um, why does the DOT care about vehicle maintenance? Why is it part of the CSA uh, basket of things they're looking at? So CSA has different basics and vehicle maintenance is one of those basics. And how CSA works is they rate a carrier on their violations in its, um, in its correlation with the risk of crashes. So unfortunately, we don't have zero fatalities and, and accidents on the road. Uh, so when they investigate these crashes, part of that is the maintenance of the vehicle. Uh, there's been many accidents or crashes in the news and they're like, you know, brakes failed on this or, you know, a tire came off and, you know, injured somebody. Right. So when they look at the vehicle maintenance and they look at crash relationship to that, they want to make sure that the vehicles aren't the problem causing the crashes. Right. So that's why they look at vehicle maintenance uh, very closely. I remember um, years ago, I was having problems with the car that I was driving at the time and it felt just something was weird as I was holding the steering wheel. And I looked at the tire and I didn't see anything wrong with the tire visually but it just didn't feel right going down the road. And I finally got it in a new shop and had them take a look at it. And it turns out that four out of the five lug nuts on that tire had somehow come loose. And all I could think about was what in the world would happen if I'm going 70 miles an hour down the freeway coming to work in the morning and they just came off and that tire starts rolling down the road. And you know, as you talk here, I think about our drivers and the loads that we haul and the amount of weight and speed and power going down the road. If a tire were to come off or something like that, what sort of catastrophe could follow that? So we actually had a driver here, we, we caught it on the dash cam where a commercial vehicle in front of the driver, it was a one ton pickup with a skid steer trailer and the back tire of the pickup actually came off. Oh. And the physics of it is, you're going down the road at 70 miles an hour when nothing else is holding that tire back it will actually gain speed so it actually hit the vehicle next to our driver bounced off and crossed all of the median and it wasn't a small median it was pretty big yeah. and crossed over to the other lane of traffic going the other direction and went completely across the road so thankfully nobody was hurt on the other side but you see the potential for what could happen right for sure tires is, is a big thing. Um, as we think about vehicle maintenance, 
obviously tires are something we want our drivers paying attention to. Yeah. Wear in the tires and any anything that might cause that tire to fail. Yeah. What are some of the other main things? You can talk more about tires or anything else you want, but what are some things our drivers really need to be paying attention to when it comes to vehicle maintenance? So I always use the term low hanging fruit. Yeah. We, we as humans, we always look for the easy stuff. So when a driver is being passed by an officer or they're in an inspection station, officer is not going to sit there and want to go in depth on every truck. So he's looking for the low hanging fruit. Okay. Hey, do I have a headlight out? Do I have a marker light out? Uh, you know, is my vehicle, do I see body parts hanging off? Things like that. Because then what the officer is going to do is say, okay, you come in, we're going to inspect you further because I already know I've got a violation on you because I can see it. Yeah. So let's inspect you further. Uh, and once you're in there, now you're going to end up usually with more vehicle maintenance problems or other problems from inspection. Whereas if you to just maintain the vehicle, fix the defects, then you're probably not that guy that's getting pulled around back. Right. Um, but lights, tires, uh, because believe it or not, uh, scales will be watching trucks drive by and you can see the tire that's just flapping because it's no longer on the bead of the rim. Okay. So lights, tires, uh, and brakes. Uh, you know, watch YouTube. There's some great footage out there of people that are coming in pretty hot and you see smoke and brakes or they're not able to stop very well. Well, guess what? You're going to be around back. Yeah, kind of that low hanging fruit you said or the idea that where there's smoke, there's fire. Yeah. You know, if, if there's a little thing that can be seen, there's a chance at least that there's something bigger and it now makes it worth the time of that officer to pull you in yeah. and do a deeper dive on things. So what's interesting, it doesn't have to do with vehicle maintenance, but when trucks are going down the road, uh, other than lights and tires, the, the number two things that'll get you pulled in is not wearing your seatbelt and speeding. Hmm. And I was at a safety meeting yesterday, and it was interesting to hear the Minnesota State Patrol say that they're no, they're focusing more on the one to five miles an hour over than they are on the rest of them. Why is that? Because the one to five, usually you're just kind of like, uh, okay, it's not, it's not anything. It's like, well, okay, whatever, just give you a warning, or, you know, there's no CSA points on it. Okay. But come to find out that a lot of the officers might have pulled them over doing 12 over, but they only wrote them for five. Well, that way it doesn't hurt you. Well, now they're looking at it differently going, whatever you pulled them over for is what you're going to write it for. Okay. Trying to make that more accountability instead yeah. of just, because our, your end game is to change the behavior of a driver. And if what you're currently doing isn't changing the behavior, you have to look at what's, what you need to do differently. Right. Well, in terms of speaking about behavior, what are some of those behaviors that we want our drivers to have? I think about pre and post trip inspections. Mm -hmm. And you know, we've talked in the past as a company about making sure that our owner operator partners are taking those seriously and not, as they say, pencil whipping. Yep. You know, getting taking enough time to do a good pre trip and a good post trip, not getting it all done in two minutes so you can get down the road, <laughs> right? Yeah really digging in. I, I know someone who, who bought a house recently and didn't spend enough time in the inspection before they bought the home. And now that they're finding all kinds of trouble because they whipped through the process early and now it's kind of biting them. Yeah. And so during a pre-trip and a post-trip, what should our be driver, what should our drivers be doing to really make those effective? First of all, get your mind prepared for it. Because if you're in that mindset of, I just want to get it done and get out of here, you're not necessarily going to be in the mindset of, I'm going to pay attention to every little thing. Uh, I use the term looking but not seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, especially when you're pulling out from an intersection, you can look one way and then look the other, but you may not have seen everything that was over there because you're not really focused on it. So keep in mind, what's the number one reason that we do that pre and post trip inspection? It's for safety. And I always tell drivers, well, whose safety is it for? Well, they go, well, everyone around me. Well, yeah, but you too. Right. Uh, because you could be out in the middle of nowhere, and if you got a steering component that comes apart or a tire that blows on a steer, that could be a bad day for you. 
Yeah. You know, semi versus car, the semi's going to win, but semi versus merge abutment, the uh, semi's not going to win. Right. So they have to be in that mindset of we value our life and we value the lives of those around us. So when we're doing that pre trip, keep that in mind that I'm making sure that not only the motor public is safe, but I'm safe too. Yeah, I imagine that if there were to be an accident or something and it came back that the, the driver, the owner operator hadn't completed a pre-trip or hadn't done a very in-depth one where an issue that caused the accident could have been caught. Um, not only does that again get real bad for reputation, yeah. but it, it brings a lot of blame on, on the owner operator who chose to foresee or forego that easy step at the beginning just to hurry up and get down the road. Correct. And when I do training with some of my customers, I always bring up uh, lawsuits. You know, they have a term called nuclear verdicts now, where anything over 10 million is considered a nuclear verdict. Well, if a driver showed that they were negligent in doing their job, and that was a factor in the crash, you're gonna start, you know, that's gonna line you up for a nuclear verdict. So what, what would you rather do? Would you take your time, do 15, 20 minute pre-trip and post-trip? Or would you rather spend 20 years in jail and pay multi-million dollars in, in restitution because you killed somebody or injured them? Right. So you have to be in the mindset of why am I doing this and why is it important? And remembering that an accident of failure in a vehicle, that could happen at any moment. It's not, it could happen in any day. Just because your truck was running great one day doesn't mean that the next day something didn't fall off. You didn't run over something that damaged your tire. At some point, that brake goes from being okay to not being okay. And nobody comes to tell you that. If you're not there looking at it and paying attention to it day by day, you don't know when that moment's going to come. Exactly. And, you know, I've never woke up in the morning and thought, well, today's the day I'm going to get in an accident. Right? Yep. I mean, we don't plan for that kind of stuff. We plan not to experience that kind of stuff. And so I really like your, what you're saying about getting your mind right every morning and saying, I'm going to do what I can do now to make sure that I don't have an accident later today. Yeah. And then at the end of your shift, I'm going to do what I can do now to make sure that I'm ready to go again tomorrow. And if you, other than looking at safety, you look at money too, because, you know, especially in owner ops, they're looking to control costs. We're not out here trucking for funsies. We're here to make a dollar. Yep. Um, so having your truck fixed on your timeline at a shop is so much cheaper than having a roadside call. Uh, I just saw a invoice come through for a couple of brake canisters that was 400 and some dollars just for the roadside call. Yeah. So, you know, try to catch that stuff beforehand so you're repairing it on your timeline. So you're saving money. Yeah. But the first primary is that safety of you and those around you. Yeah, I grew up, I'm the son of a trucker, and he, it's all my dad ever did. But I remember a lot of that time that he was home on the weekend, he was out in his shop, he was greasing his fifth wheel, he was doing a PM, he was going through his truck so that when he was back out working again, he didn't miss time and the truck worked the way it was supposed to, and that he was as safe as possible out on the road. And I really liked what you said, that something can happen in the truck at any time. That's why I even encourage drivers, wherever you get to unload or load, or if you're just stopping for a break, is to walk around the truck. Uh, because you can use all of your senses to do an inspection. Mm -hmm. Say you're driving down the road all of a sudden, you're like, is that brake I smell or clutch or is that burning wire? Well, then you're going to pull over and take a look at it. Right. And yeah, absolutely. Stuff goes wrong as you're driving and the driver's like, well, that happened, you know, while I was driving. I get it. I still drive today and stuff happens while you're driving. That's why I always encourage when you, whenever you stop the truck, take a couple minutes and walk around. Yeah. Uh, you know, just touch your tires. Are your tires hot? Well, maybe one's low on air and that's why I got extra heat out of one tire or could be a bearing failure. So you, you always just want to be using your senses every time you stop walking around the truck. Yeah, we uh, we talk about family around autumn. 
and this being a place where we know drivers' names, we know their interests, their families, they're not just a driver number, and they're not just a steering wheel holder, you know, they're a person. And I think it's important that drivers don't think of themselves just as steering wheel holders either, but really as owner operators. They're owning and operating their own business. And a big part of that is paying attention to your equipment. Any business pays attention to their equipment to make sure that it's working and that it will continue to be profitable for them. Do you see think that the DOT has kind of upped the ante recently on vehicle maintenance? Is this something that you're seeing as a bigger focus for them right now than it used to be? As far as a bigger focus, I don't think so, but as far as technology goes, it's re they've really upped their game. Talk about that. Uh, so before you'd pull over, uh, their hand or a hammer was, oh, check your tires. Uh, you know, if they want to check your brakes, they would measure them out, and that's all they used for that. Uh, if they wanted to measure you, they broke out the tape measure and stuff. Yeah. Well, now with technology, uh, one of the things I was interested to learn at a safety conference this in January was they have tire anomaly detectors now, mm. where there's three lines cut into the concrete with sensors, and as the truck drives over it, it will flash a picture on the screen in the scale house showing every tire on the vehicle, and it will put a red X when the tire anomaly is detected, like it's not doesn't have the same pressure as the other ones, or something's just not right with that tire, so then they gotta pull it around and figure out what's wrong with that tire. Uh, which, wow. uh, I think they said in the state of Minnesota, the beginning part of the year, they had issued 25 tire violations. They put this in and up at the Red River scale, and I can't remember if it was 225 or 255 in a matter of about three months. Wow. That they went up to because of this tire anomaly detector. Uh, so when you're looking at tires, it's not only the tread and any damage, but what's the actual air pressure on the tire? Because that will determine, you know, if there's less load on one, that's going to trigger that anomaly detector. Yeah, so I can't just stop and just kind of kick it with the side of my boot and call my tire good anymore. Yep. So as the fleet message I just put out, I said, I've been looking for a pair of boots that has an air gauge in it, but I haven't found them yet. <laughs> well, maybe that's your next million dollar idea. <laughs> Uh, but then they also have this uh, new technology called brake performance testing. So before how they would test that is they would get a truck up to 20 miles an hour, they'd dynamite the brakes and then measure the stopping distance. Well now they actually have a little trailer that they can tow with them anywhere they go and put the truck up there and it will measure the percentage of brake efficiency hmm. for that vehicle. And that again, it goes through, it tests each axle uh, each end of it, and it will generate a report whether that vehicle passes the brake efficiency test. So, you know, that's way different than just, oh, get up to 20 miles an hour and lock up the brakes. Right. That's actually delving deep down into Definitely. it. Uh, they also have infrared heat sensors. Uh, so if you're pulling into a scale and you see these cameras that are low okay. to the ground, oh, are they doing my speed? No, they're checking the brakes. So if a brake is not functioning correctly, it's not gonna have as much heat when you come into that scale from slowing down as one that's functioning correctly. So if they're seeing colors that are, are not right, they should be seeing the reds and oranges. If they're seeing blues and greens, yeah. they're gonna pull you around and start checking your brakes because it should be uh, at a certain, you know, should be working, should have heat generated. And then also uh, some of the scales are now using the laser enforced height uh, which goes, it's not a CSA thing because there's no points for over height or over weight, but still that's another reason for you to get pulled around back. Yeah. So. In the, in my ears, all I'm hearing is drivers screaming like government overreach. <laughs> all of this technology is killing me. Why don't they just let me do my job? As a safety director, what, what is your come back to that when a driver says I don't understand why they got all this technology they're just looking to bust me somebody just looking to bust me so the big brother's looking over me and he's really crushing me exactly uh, so safety meeting I was at yesterday there was an owner of a company that that's what was talked about was vehicle maintenance and they get done telling all this technology and the owner goes so what do I do 
you tell me you've got all this technology, so what do I do? Because this brake performance tester, I can't, he's like, I can't bring my truck to the scale and check it. Uh, he goes, how, how do I work with this? And actually the portable brake tester efficiency is something that's not government owned, it's outside, so anyone can purchase them. Uh, not that, you know, owner ops are gonna go out and buy one, but you know, there's ways to work with it. But I always try to get them to understand why they're doing what they're doing. And it's because of crashes. Yeah. And it gets back to that, make sure we're doing our part to prevent crashes. Because what gets back to the, we value life. Yeah. So if you're in the mindset of why <clears throat> this is happening, if you're doing what you're supposed to, your odds of having negative interactions all the time are pretty slim. And what I want drivers to also understand is just because you got a violation at roadside doesn't mean it's always legitimate. And that's where the system called data cube comes in. Okay. So if they feel that they were wrongly um, put, had a violation, uh, we can go into the data queue system and submit why we don't feel this is a violation and then get it contested and it would either be removed or upheld. So personally, whenever a driver comes to me and says, well, I want to data queue this, and I go, okay, tell me why. And none of the reasons can be because the officer's stuck, you know, he was having a bad day, or, you know, he just wanted to make me it's No, okay, I was written for this light. Well, this light isn't required, so why did I get a violation that it was out? Perfect. Uh, we'll note the notes on the inspection. We'll send the, the report with our argument into the, the state that, uh, that issued it and then we'll get a determination so just because you know they're doing more things we're all human so mistakes are made right so don't think that everybody does everything perfect every time no nope. you know nobody does but we have to do as much as we can to make sure we're preventing being the part that that's an accident because of our vehicle yeah and it kind of makes me think of um, one of my kids, when they were younger, still have a lot of energy as an older teen now, but when they were younger, had a lot of energy. And we talked to him about, hey, your, your teacher said this, that you were doing this. And his response was, it was never like, yes, dad, I was doing wrong. It was more like, why are they always picking on me? Why am I always getting in trouble? And if you dig down into it, it was, because he was usually disrupting the class. You know, he was <laughs> causing the problem. And there's, I think there's a tendency to say, you know, oh, why is the government trying to bust me? Well, like you said, if you're doing the right things out there and you are taking the, the time to pre and post trip and the extra walk arounds and using your, all your senses to monitor your truck, you're probably not gonna get any violations. Like the likelihood is going way down if you're, not doing those things, if you're pencil whipping your pre and post trips, if you're more concerned with just getting the load as fast as I can to the next spot and then getting on to the next load, that behavior and mindset is raising the likelihood that you're gonna have a problem. Correct. And it isn't that you, Chris, are wanting to pick on any of our owner operators or that Mr. DOT officer just wants to get an autumn guy today. It's Usually, like we said at the very beginning, where there's some smoke, there's fire. And where there's low hanging fruit, they dig in deeper and have a tendency to find other things. Yeah. Now, when that does happen, there's this CSA score. Yeah. How do these vehicle uh, maintenance violations affect driver CSA scores? So drivers have, just for a lack of, they have their own scores. You know, there's not like a number or percentage to their scores, but they have something that's called the PSP, which is the pre-screen program. And what it does is tracks a driver's previous three years for roadside violations and five years of crashes. So if they're getting a number of vehicle maintenance violations consistently, as, as a safety guy, when we're hiring, I look at their PSPs and go, hmm, this guy seems to have an issue with vehicle maintenance. Right. So. You know, I always equate it, they're like, well, it was the carrier, it was the carrier. I, I can see that in some because I, I, I'm pretty familiar with companies. I'm like, yeah, they got a bad reputation. They're, yeah, I get that. 
But if it's happening at multiple carriers, it's kind of like when you were dating. Hey, maybe it's not the other person. Maybe it is you. Yeah, if you have the same problem with everybody you're dating, it's probably you yeah. that's the problem. So the same thing with, with drivers. You, you're having the same vehicle maintenance that every carrier you go to. Problem's likely you. Yeah. So when we go to hire, we look at that and go, hmm, no, nah, we, we can pass. So it affects them and their job ability to hold a job, one, because if they're racking up violations, carrier isn't going to put up with that. Right. And then if you want to go hire on somewhere else, you print off their PSP, and it's nothing but vehicle maintenance violations, the odds are you're going to get passed over. That kind of makes me think of a uh, football player, Antonio Brown. Great football player, but every yeah. team you fight on, he had trouble, either on the team or with law enforcement. And he got to a point where nobody wanted to sign him yeah, because he wasn't worth the hassle, he wasn't worth the risk. As great of a football player he was, all the drama that came with him wasn't worth it. Yeah. And as a company here at Autumn, you might be as efficient at you know getting the load down the road as anybody else, but if you come in with all these vehicle maintenance points on your PSP, you know, you, at some point you're no longer worth the risk to the carrier who'd be looking at hiring you. Correct. And I'm not talking like you got one or two violations because their violations are going to happen. It's we try to minimize them and keep the severity down. You know, like, oh, you got to mark your light out okay. You mean anytime a guy gets one violation, you don't call him and start screaming at him oh, from your office? No, no, it never does that. I, I always try to talk to him because, like you say, it, the biggest thing we as humans want to know is why. Yeah. Why? And I'm the same way. So why'd this happen? Oh, I was driving down the road to hit some debris or whatever, broke the light, never got up. Okay, well, I get it. What are you going to do next time? <laughs> uh, but what the guys I'm talking about is if you print off a PSP, it should be like one, maybe two pages. Mm -hmm. uh, I was with one carrier. We printed off the guy's PSP. It was seven pages. And we knew where we were going to hire him as soon as it said page four was printing. Uh, but then I also look at what are the violations? Are they repeated? Hey, the guy's got four flat tires or four light violations. Yeah. Are they repeated all the time? Yep. Okay, well, we got a pattern. And, oh, no, but it's lights here, a tire here, or a brake here. So at least they're learning their lesson as they go. Right. But if there's a ton of them, we're not going to be considering them as an applicant. Well, what is the implication to the carrier when the when a driver gets a vehicle maintenance violation, how does that impact the carrier CSA score? So the score, there's what's called thresholds, and depending on if you're hazmat or non-hazmat carriers, where the threshold will be. Once you exceed the threshold, then you're prioritized for an intervention. Uh, where the DOT, the first one you get, the first basic over, they send you a letter that says, hey, you're on a radar. That's never a good word, is it, by the way? Intervention. No. <laughs> it never seems to be like you're in a good situation. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we're having a donut intervention today. <laughs> you might need a donut intervention. <laughs> and he isn't lying. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, it's never a good thing. That's usually somebody calling going, hey, uh, you're on our radar here. You might want to start tweaking something. Otherwise, we're coming in for an audit. Uh, once they come in for an audit, it can be focused. Like, hey, we're just going to inspect your vehicle maintenance stuff. And then we're out of here, or they can decide, hey, we're going to look at your vehicle maintenance. Oh, well, you've got some issues. Now we're going to go on to hours of service. Now we're going to go on to, so you're opening the company to a larger uh, exposure when they come in for an audit. But then also, uh, carrier, other carriers, like if brokers, uh, insurance companies, your CSA data is public. So... Say you go for insurance renewal and they sit down and they're like, hey, we see your CSA scores. Oh, you're deficient here, you're deficient here. Hmm. I think the underwriter is going to see this for your renewal period. So you could be looking at higher insurance premiums. Uh, what if you want to work with a broker and they pull your CSA scores and go, <laughs> no. So now you're looking at less loads, higher cost to run the truck. Uh, it's just going to be harder for the carrier in general to operate as it normally does. Does that impact how often I might get pulled into a scale? Absolutely. So we have the bypass system uh, on there we use DriveWise and it actually sends us 
uh, reports what our polling percentages are. And a CSA is a direct reflection of your polling percentages. And when I first came here, we, some of the states, we had a 30 to 40% polling rate. Mm -hmm. And now that the CSA scores are lower, we're in the teens or single digits in some states for polling rates. And if a driver doesn't want to spend time at a scale, because the average level two walk around is about 20 minutes or more. Level one is around an hour. So where do you want to save your time at? Do you want to save your time at the beginning and do that inspection, get any defects caught and fixed? Or do you want a chance and then end up wasting an hour down the road? Yeah, so what you're saying then is that the drive-wise and the, the polling rate, that affects the entire fleet. Mm -hmm. So all autumn trucks. Correct. So if driver A, B, and C are consistently getting dinged because of vehicle maintenance issues, mm -hmm. that's going to raise the company's CSA score. And as that goes up, then everybody else, drivers X, Y, Z, are getting pulled in more often. Correct. And I got to think that the more often you're pulled in, the more often things may be found. Correct. So it's best to, like I say to my kids, fly low under the radar yeah. and, and don't get caught up in everything else. And so to do that, most effectively, we have to work as an entire fleet to keep those vehicle maintenance issues down, those violations low, and continue to drop our CSA score so that all of those things that you just talked about, the ability to work with others, less time at scales, um, lower insurance premiums, all of those things um, come together for the betterment, not only of Autumn, but for the owner operators who are out there every day. Correct. Now, do we do anything to reward guys when they get good vehicle inspections? Yep, we currently do. If you get a clean level three, you get $25. If you get a clean level two, you get 50. And a clean level one, you get $100. So there, there is a little bit of an incentive um, just on the side to, yeah, go ahead and get that inspection and give me a clean. I'm all ready to go. Bring it on. Yeah. And for drivers that are at the terminal, if I'm here and I inspect you and you pass, you get a gift card also. You get the $25 gift card. Oh, nice. So if you're on the terminal, come find me. Very nice. That's cool. Well, anything else that you wanted to say? I appreciate you taking time out of your day to have this conversation. Anything else, kind of a closing thought for you? I just want to say, you know, vehicle maintenance is a, a high priority for safety. And everyone just needs to keep in mind why we want to be safe. And that's for the protection of life, ours and those around us. Uh, and I love the statement <clears throat> you made earlier. I don't plan, up to, plan to get up today and get into an accident. Uh, I had a driver tell me that, and I said, well, hold on. And he goes, what are you doing? I said, going to talk to the GM because we need to fire you. Why is that? Uh, because if you plan on getting into an accident, we don't want you in our fleet. Oh, yeah. Uh, because you're right. nobody plans on getting up, but things happen. So let's just do our best to try to prevent accidents or crashes that are within our control, especially with vehicle maintenance. Definitely. Well, I want to thank everybody for listening today to the Values Driven Service Delivered podcast. It's our goal to continue to add value to your drive time, bringing you discussions with autumn personnel, driver interviews, and other content that we think will benefit you as owner-operators out on the road. We'd appreciate it if you give this podcast a like, check out our YouTube channel, or follow us on social media. You can find us all over the place, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, everything like that, and I'll link that in the show notes so you can follow along on the journey. Until next time, everybody, be smart, be safe, and be joyful. Thanks. Stop. It's in record, Chris. Cool, let's go back and do another one. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's in record. I'm just gonna save ads right away. <laughs> Chris Senti, save ads, baby. Awesome. And kind of right when I was 39 minutes around, well, the whole thing is 39 minutes. Yeah. So if you take away a couple minutes on the beginning.